Hello and a good afternoon, good morning, and a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined in with us today. On behalf of EC Council, I want to thank all of you for being present here, as well as I want to extend a really warm welcome to Wayne Burke, who has made time to be with us and take today's session. Anyway, over to you, Wayne. Hey, excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Welcome and uh, gives me great honor to be delivering this uh, session to you folks. I uh, aim to bring you some hopefully new information that you folks are going to be able to do, take to the world of ethical hacking, penetration testing, and we're going to be talking about the importance of best tools techniques, and that means we need to speak about AI, blockchain, IoT, and when we start merging those technologies together, you're going to see we get more advanced tools, right? We got to play more advanced offense as well as more advanced defense to ensure we stay in the game. So the topics for today will be a quick cyber tech update. We're gonna be looking at some uh, videos to warm you folks up. And then we'll be diving into artificial intelligence. We'll then discuss how it plays a role within what we've seen in the cybersecurity realm right now. And we'll be diving a bit deeper into the importance of blockchain, IOTs, and of course, we're gonna be build, bringing you some hands-on awesomeness with Ponagotchi. If you haven't heard of Ponagotchi, we're going to show you how you can build an AI-based Raspberry Pi Zero. And uh, it's really mainly for us to start learning more about artificial intelligence and networking. So we've got a whole jam-packed session for today planned. And uh, about 15 minutes before the session finishes, we're going to open up for Q&A. So if those of you got any specific questions, we hope to inform you that we bring you vendor neutral information that's based upon any job responsibility that you might have as a penetration tester. So we're gonna start off with some videos first, folks. And uh, there are links at the end that um, I will be posting for you folks to go and keep up with some of this. We're gonna just uh, warm up first with the fundamentals of Blockchain. So many people have a misconception about blockchain. So we're actually going to watch a pretty interesting uh, presentation from uh, this wonderful lady that is actually presenting the term to a broad range of young children from the age of five all the way up to ba from very basic level all the way up to expert level. So we're going to watch the first couple of minutes so you can truly understand that we're looking at this expert that is explaining one concept in five levels of difficulty. So this is Bettina Warburg, and uh, she's the co-founder of Animal Ventures. So without further ado, let's check out this little intro. My name is Bettina Warburg. I'm a researcher of transformative technologies and co-founder of Animal Ventures. Today, I've been challenged to explain one concept at five levels of increasing complexity. My topic is blockchain technology. Blockchain is a new network, and it's going to help us decentralize trade, allowing us to do a lot of our transactions much more peer-to-peer -peer directly and lower our use of intermediaries like companies or banks maybe. I think today everyone can leave understanding something about blockchain at some level. Do you know what we're gonna talk about today? It's called blockchain. What's blockchain? That's a really good question. It's actually a way that we can trade. Do you know what trade is? Mm -hmm. it's, when, it's when you take turns you sign. That's when you give up most of what you want, right? When you give up most of what you want? Well, sometimes that definitely happens for sure. Well, uh, see, kids are brutally honest, right? So remember, this child is under the age of seven. So for the first seven years of a child's life, they are in a hypnotic state. They learn by watching, right? And of course, she's obviously watching maybe her parents doing some trading. And her idea is, well, when you trade, you've got to give up most of what you want. So she's obviously got some older brothers or sisters. We're looking at maybe social engineering here as well, folks, not just blockchain. Sure. What if I told you? 
that there's a kind of technology that I work on that means you could trade with any kid all over the world. Really? Yeah. If I could trade with any kid, I would trade, well, I would trade something I don't like so much. That's probably a good idea. Maybe somebody else likes it more than you do. So normally when people trade, they have to go to the store or they have to know the person so that they can get what they asked for. With blockchain, you can make that exact same trade, but you don't need the store and you don't even necessarily need to know the other person. All right, so that was pretty straightforward, right? That was a five-year-old. Okay, let's move on to level two, the teenager. So Ian, do you know what blockchain is? No. Have you ever traded or sold anything? Actually, I'm selling my computer on eBay right now. That's amazing. What made you decide to trade on eBay? Um, well, I, I mean, I've heard of it and I trust it a lot because there's they have like all of their guarantees. So I, I know that I'm gonna get money and the person's gonna get what they want. So what if I told you that blockchain technology is basically a tool where you can do the exact same thing but it goes to you and I directly. You wouldn't need an eBay or a brand in between. That's cool. And there's a lot of those kinds of middlemen. So I think what's pretty clear here, they're talking about one element of blockchain being used for cryptocurrencies. And if you haven't ever invested or used any cryptocurrencies, I'm not suggesting you do so. I'm just gonna be suggesting that you learn a lot more about the fundamentals of the science behind cryptocurrencies. And that science is blockchain. So when we start looking at cryptocurrency, there's a ledger. So if you ever study any accountancy, the ledger is an append only ledger. So when we start looking at some of the uses of blockchain technology, of course it's cryptocurrency, but beyond that, we start to look at maybe distributing electricity across a grid, where we start to use a lot more ingenious types of generation of energy. In our society today, right? We have a lot of banks, we have yeah. a lot of companies that sort of help us make sure that our trades happen. Mm -hmm. But if we could guarantee the same trade using technology as sort of like a technological trust, then we wouldn't really need all those middlemen in between. So, how does it work? It's basically a network of computers. Well, okay, okay. This is starting, this is a this is a computer system that's been networked and there's many 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 nodes in that network folks when we go to cover advanced we got to make sure you all familiar with the foundational things so we're making sure we got some good foundation first for the session today that all have the same history of transactions and so instead of sort of there being one company with one database that holds all the information the same sort of list is held by all these different people like you could have it on your computer and then it gets validated by everyone. And basically that turns into the next part of the list. So it's sort of constantly updating itself. So like, how do you make sure that it's secure? So it uses cryptography and that helps it basically encode all of the transactions. So you can't really see exactly what happened, but you know it happened because it's like a marker. So you can so there's the pen only. Okay, we're gonna just pick up some speed here. So we're gonna go along over to the more experienced expert, give us his quick take on AI and blockchain and the mathematics behind this. We're actually seeing a lot more use cases for blockchain that aren't around the currency. Um, so to buy something from you, this information gets logged and when we met it, we'll have to rewrite the, a lot of rules, hacks, and uh, we're going to need a research state. Lots of different fields are starting to each other, but just need to trust the mechanism by which change previous data within it. the blockchain. A technical definition of blockchain is that it is um, a persistent, transparent, public, append-only ledger. Um, so it is a system that you can add data to Okay, so you can see where this information is important. It's starting to open up your possibilities to how are we going to take all of this knowledge and distribute it across multiple different node network devices, as an example. And not change previous data within it. Um, it does this through a mechanism for creating consensus between scattered or distributed parties that do not need to trust each other, but just need to trust the mechanism by which their consensus is arrived at. Um, in the case of blockchain, it relies on some form of challenge 
such that no one actor on the network is able to solve this challenge consistently more than everyone else on the network. So it randomizes. Yes, yeah, it randomizes the process and in theory ensures that no one can force the blockchain to accept a particular entry onto the ledger that others disagree with. One that uh, relies on a mechanism for a peer-to-peer -peer network that can maintain updates to the ledger and then verify those updates in such a way that it is impossible to defraud and impossible to alter after the fact. Okay, we'll just pause at that because, because now we're starting to go like, hang on a second, well, that, that might mean a loss of work for us. So well, of course you can watch the rest of that folks. That was just your really quick morning warm up on some of the foundational things we wanna be a lot more familiar with. So that was uh, Bettina Warburg. And uh, this next little quick warm up is a minute 30 seconds showing you how we can take this technology we call blockchain that obviously stems into AI, artificial intelligence. And of course, there's no you know, presentation without mentioning uh, Elon Musk. Uh, we lived in the same area in South Africa, funny enough. So you might hear the accent is not real English. It's not real South African. It's not real American. I've lived in a lot of different countries and uh, I'm very proud to say that um, that's what's taught me about the world, right? Realizing that a lot of other cultures exist and uh, you learn the old school respect, honor model where you wanna try and help people. So uh, let's take a quick look at this flyby AI from Shield AI. So obviously there's no pilot or GPS. This is all based upon, and you only seen one of these devices flying around, but start thinking about seeing a hundred of these devices all flying around, all connected to the same neural network link, all con co contributing to the actual AI learning and algorithm that they're continuously adapting. <laughs> And then a straight quick transition into fly by AI for indoor search. So this is where you're going to be able to basically search and recovery, looking maybe for injured people, as an example. Obviously, a lot of military folks would look at weaponizing these things. Hopefully, on the other side of the fence, we're looking at how we can actually help civilization. <laughs> All righty, so I'm going to pause at that because I think we get the gist of this, folks. This is AI. Um, I'm looking at this video going like, I wish I had this in the beginning when I first learned how to build some of these drones and then look at what they could be done with. And, you know, so I crashed a lot of these things because uh, we didn't have all of these cool things we are uh, seeing in this little video. So uh, that's just one application of AI. And of course, we're going to be showing you Ponagotchi later on, where we're going to be showing you what you can do and how you can build those same types of devices that are going to be based upon AI. Um, now, that was a really uh, awesome presentation, uh, video demo. Let me just bring up the presentation slide again. And uh, you can see it's a fully autonomous indoor flight without a pilot, and obviously it's all based upon AI. That's why it's called Fly by AI. Uh, I'm not going to get too deep into uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink. You can go and watch the uh, full working demo that just streamed on August 28th to get the latest updates. Um, it's not a push for this technology in your faces. This is, as Elon put it, a recruitment video. Of course, this is where people start realizing that we're not going to live without AI. AI is already in use in so many instances. 
along with the blockchain technologies. So when you start looking deeper into this, when we are afraid of what AI could potentially become, it's normally because we don't have enough knowledge about AI. As Albert Einstein said, if you cannot explain something that's very complex in a simple way, you don't understand the complexities well enough. So you need to be able to simplify something that's very complex. And that's the part where we start looking at just the bad sides. Well, look at the good side a lot of the times first, because if you're thinking about bad things, that's not a good positive outlook on life, right? We know that 80% of people will be far healthier if they just exercise in the morning and exercise before they go to bed and they eat a lot of fruit and vegetables, healthy food. So we're not going to get into pandemics or anything else like that. We let you all know the reason why humans are in this position is because they put themselves to a large degree into this position by not keeping their maintenance of their technology up to date. So when people are eating processed food and you look at what's in that processed food, folks, you see why we have these problems. So as I mentioned, we're not going to talk about that today. Uh, for Elon Musk's positive look on the neural link, that's basically a brain implant that's going to help initiate people with disease or that's been in a motor vehicle accident. So people that have actually had some kind of brain damage and they are not having all of their electricity and sensors and all the neurons fire properly. So that's where kind of we've come from and where we are pretty much at within the next 12 months, they will be starting the first human trial of the neural link. Now, people are starting to already freak out now because we're talking about penetration testing, right? And so when we look at penetration testing, what is the purpose of penetration testing? Um, I think to perform a security assessment to allow you to follow a methodology that the methodology doesn't really change, but the tools change hourly, especially in today's day and age when we, you know, we're talking about zero days taking 100 plus days to get to the industry. And now we see in the zero day exploit code being released before the firmware update of like Apple in the recent times, right? So. Today is um, a look into the future and how we need to adapt our tools to become more intelligent using AI, blockchains, and we're talking about penetration testing. So information gathering, network mapping, vulnerability identification. Uh, you're not doing a, a vulnerability assessment there. You're looking as a penetration tester to find vulnerabilities manually. If we are going to go and do, let's say, a black box pen test and we're going to, you know, knock outside the door with a huge, you know, a, a, a megaphone speakerphone saying, hey, folks, we have to do some social engineering, get all your people ready for some cool action. Obviously, we have to try and emulate the bad guys. And that's the part where come from a, 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 a multitude, very diverse background where I was fortunate enough to grow up with Commodore 64 ZX Spectrum computers, right? Now, if we look at the speed of evolution, now if you take one of those machines and you want to see how many Commodore 64 computers you would need to equivalent one new cell phone, incidentally, all the new technology like the cell phones come in with AI, you know, uh, neural compute stick capabilities, cores built in, right? You'd need about 150,000 Commodore 64 computers to equate to one new off-the-shelf cell phone nowadays. So we see in this technology evolving rapidly. So the vulnerability identification, we do that typically manually. And then we look for potential entry points. So it's like we get to the site, the building location, we walk around the building, and we start looking for any potential open types of windows or methods that we're going to be able to, you know, bypass some kind of door or lock as an example. And so we obviously look into attempt to penetrate their best defenses normally, those doors, windows, and so on. And once we've gained access, we might only be in one small little room that's locked up from the other door. So the next thing would be to continue to then break outside perhaps of that segmented network. So we're gonna have an advanced pen test that we're gonna have to go through multiple network segmentation drops continuously going through this model. So as we get through the next door, 
we go through and we got to look at, oh, we want to enumerate further. Well, you might need to use an exploit to go any further because you might be behind another device that you don't have any other way but by finding a potential exploit or a way to circumvent the access control lists on the routers and so forth. So uh, once you've done the enumeration further, you then move into compromising users, looking at other potential sites, exfiltrating data and maintaining access, so adding some backdoor persistency and then normally covering some of the tracks so uh, they can keep that cyber campaign running for as long as possible. So great resource. This was a document written in 2006 and it's the original information system security assessment framework that uh, I encourage you still to view because we're still using TCP IP folks that was designed without security. I'm just saying there's certain things in cyber that have to eventually change and eventually it's going to be our TCP IP. When we have technologies like blockchain, you start realizing that the problem right now is that there's an unbalanced power struggle within the technology being used globally. And so obviously everybody's trying to control the network. And when we go everything over to the AI blockchain, yada, 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 we should get some stability back in and balance that power struggle that's currently going on. Another awesome, awesome, more up-to-date resource is the pentest-standard.org website. You folks can go and have a look at that. Uh, this session is being recorded, so I'm sure that uh, EC Council will be making available for you folks to uh, go through this at a slower pace, perhaps. So uh, let's get into some artificial intelligence and a little bit more about blockchain and really three major benefits that we're going to gain by combining these two technologies. So we're talking about artificial intelligence and blockchain. So remember, AI and encryption working together. Well, we've realized that so many companies are being targeted and we've been able to do things like, well, we don't use SSL anymore, right? Because SSL 1, 2, and 3, your secure socket layer, well, we know that's completely compromised. So we need to not be speaking SSL anymore. It's so confusing. We should be replacing everything and only speaking TLS. But then we start realizing that there's certain countries that are doing some crafty things with transport layer security, like some of those foreign countries. We're not getting into politics today. So data that's actually held on a blockchain is by its nature pretty secure, thanks to the cryptography, which is inherent in its filing system. Remember that blockchain being append only. So blockchains are going to be ideal for storing the highly sense of personal data. So when smartly processed, can obviously unlock so much value and convenience in our lives, right? We're not able to secure things currently because everything is getting hacked left, right, and center. That's because there's still a huge, huge skill shortage of cyber professionals. Now, when I mean skill short, we're talking about cyber professionals that don't really have a lot of AI background. When we go out into a poll later on, we're going to see how many of you folks have actually already been working with AI and cybersecurity products in the past couple of months. So uh, think of smart healthcare systems that make very accurate diagnosis based on medical scans, records, and so forth. So uh, we know that AI is able to actually diagnose patients so many more years ahead of any human doctor just simply looking at like the x-rays and so forth, right? So um, we now realize things like uh, Amazon, Netflix um, suggest what we might like to buy or watch next is, oh, um, yeah, we, we won't get into the money side of that though, right? So we start realizing that people that have these huge AI systems can really control them to do a whole lot more. When you start looking at some of these campaigns and we know Amazon, Hugely successful company, right? When we look at their security, what did they do in the beginning? They were like, hey, we're going to allow people to ship their purchases anywhere. And we know that it's a bit of a security risk, but guess what? Amazon, it wasn't really their problem about the security risk. If your credit card or debit card was stolen, that was your bank's problem to deal with, not Amazon's problem. So Amazon was like, hey, I need to make purchasing as easy as possible. Let people come to one place so they don't have to go and drive around town looking for other 
shops to buy something uh, you know a few bucks cheaper so those are some of the major benefits now blockchain can help us track understand and explain decisions made obviously the ai so everything has to be repeatable and of course not run by one entity so when we look at the fact that you've probably heard of uh, 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 mining bitcoin mining or cryptocurrency mining uh, people are not always aware of the actual mining is basically nodes in the network that are actually doing a lot of those transactions and verifying them so there can be never one node that does it all of course there's certain servers that have got higher power and those are the ones that normally have higher priority to be able to process some of the transactions why is this well if you go into your local starbucks now you'll notice in a lot of European and a lot of other Middle East countries, there's a lot of ATM, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency ATM machines popping up all over the place. So those are a little bit different when you want to go and withdraw money because you're going to be able to verify and validate your cryptocurrency uh, using each of the different cryptocurrency requirements. But typically, if you go into Starbucks and you want to buy a coffee, it's going to be you, you'll be able to basically uh, uh, pay five bucks for the coffee. It's going to cost you $30 because you're going to have the extra uh, transaction fees and you're going to have to wait a couple of hours for your transaction to be verified before you get your cup of coffee. So you're going to see there's going to be a lot of things that need to change to speed up this process. So uh, this is because we are capable of accessing a large number of variables independently of each other and learning, of course, which ones are important to the overall task it's trying to achieve. So taking us back to AI now, when we look at your artificial intelligent algorithms, those are going to be expected to be a lot more intelligent when it comes to making decisions about whether transactions are fraudulent and should be blocked or investigated. So this is where we start seeing a lot more of cybersecurity products have already been very much AI'd as much as they can continuously build in a lot of that AI. So what we see is obviously a lot more intake of teaching the fraudulent systems to detect more of those criminal transactions, right? So that means you need to have both the criminal and the, you need to have the good and the bad folks there, right? Good cop, bad cop, basically, continuously driving both sides. So uh, we've got to have a balance. Good and evil have to coexist in the same place. So we know that uh, if that is true, we should be able to have a very good designed infrastructure with great network segmentation using a lot more AI. So uh, for some time though, it will be necessary to have these decisions audited for accuracy by humans. So that means that we are continuously just helping our assistants, if you want to call it that, help us do things more efficiently. So that's not going to take us out of a job. People are going to have to evolve. So we're going to have to get people that are, you know, maybe the ones that are too lazy to do other work, they're going to have to realize they're going to find other work. There's always going to be a lot of work in the human delivery of services. So uh, we've got to rely on us building the technology that's going to be audited by humans still. So humans will still have the ability to turn it off because AI does not have a human heart. So given the huge amount of data that can be taken into consideration, this is obviously going to be pretty complex and we've seen a lot of different case studies in the past. So AI can manage blockchains more efficiently than humans. Obviously we get that, we start realizing why this is true. As an example, we start looking at cryptocurrency now and encryption and security. Uh, the hashing algorithms used to mine blocks on the Bitcoin blockchain take a brute force approach, effectively trying every combination of characters until they find which fits to verify a transaction. So AI is an attempt to move away from this brute force approach and manage tasks in a more intelligent, thoughtful manner. So how do we do that? Well, consider how a human expert on cracking codes will, if they are good, become better and more efficient at code breaking. They wanna try and clone themselves, right? So for me, when I'm working on a project, I love, I'm a team player all the time. Uh, we have to be in penetration testing, right? 
but you start realizing that sometimes some of us are in a zone and we want to be able to do things and we're going like but i've only got two hands and i oh that's the slow interface so we only got two hands so if we had that neural link uh connected straight to our brain we would actually be able to control our computers without having to use the keyboard being a very inefficient way of us collaborating and interfacing with that ai so currently how many people already have their cell phones and mobile phones glued to their hands and of course their hands are having to extract and input information that's a very inefficient way but we're going to see that's of course going to change so uh, here are the ways we can anticipate ai changing our work weeks so this is like dr watson detects flaws for us we will be able to focus more on quality control AI will order, automate the to-do lists. Uh, AI will seek out problems for humans to solve. So, of course, we are, we're going to just be adapting to find other elements of using our knowledge. We have to evolve, not backtrack. Now, when we start speaking about, oh, Internet of Things, we're going to talk about securing those Internet of Things that, as I'm sure you'll all agree, are popping up left, right, and center. So, uh, you know, he has a great organization, trusted-iot.org. And I think we all realize that nobody's trusting anybody lately. And that's where we've always got to verify and validate that we understand what the person's saying. Do remember this when it comes to human intelligence, especially when it's relating to social engineering. Every human sees the world through their own eyes. When you're trying to persuade them to see the world through your eyes because it's your perspective, you're not realizing that you may not get them to see the world through your eyes at that point until they've gone through some of the life experiences or learning lessons you've been through. And that's the part that everybody's got different types of data in their storage, so to say, right? And uh they're obviously trying to say, hey, well, I'm going to compete with you instead of going, hang on a second, we've got to just have an open mind. Well, I'm just going to give you the benefit of the doubt and say, okay, you're right for this. Let's just not argue the point. But how about let's just put this information together? So we take your idea. That's a bit weird. We get that, Wayne. You know, we, we know that you, you obviously, you know, dropped on your head when you're a kid or something like that. But um, uh, you, you know, everybody's got to be with an open mind. So that if we all contribute what we think it to be at this point in time, we're all going to have a much better cybersecurity AI mind that we can all utilize. It's already being utilized as we speak. So when we look at what are the goals for 2025 within cyber, I think it's going to be all about IoT, where we're going to have a lot more devices that are connected to some form of AI backend. So you'll see some of the resources I'll be showing you today. You can go and set up simple AI on a Raspberry Pi using a, a Intel uh, neural compute stick. So uh, um, a lot of systems already coming out with that literally dedicated like a Raspberry Pi, but it's got all of your AI hardware modules all built in. So we're starting to see a lot more of IoT being able to use AI to a large extent as well, where you can actually set up AI on a Raspberry Pi, as an example, with camera, identifying different types of objects. So you're going to train the camera to recognize different objects. It's still a big challenge, as I'm sure some of you have been seeing when it comes to facial recognition, when you just put different you know, decoys like a piece of square paper post-it note between your glasses if you don't wear them just put some you know sunglasses on as example or a weird picture you're holding up when you, in your stomach so you start throwing uh, weird things at ai trying to continuously increase its intelligence remember it's a machine without a heart so everything's going to become digitized and miniaturized and we can start looking at a lot more of these iot chips from uh, manufacturers such as uh, Expressive. So none of these are sponsored by any of these vendors. These are just showing you some of these open source IoT projects that you can go and get involved in. And the best way to learn the advanced is to build these little products, build the hardware and the software, so you get to see both sides of that. 
And of course, you can go and read a lot of uh, um, blockchain supply chain uh, studies. Uh, we know Amazon has recognized uh, you know, um, amazing talent when it comes to AI and their machine learning. So uh, um, as we build these little devices like Amazon Alexa, we've seen how we can then take a simple you know, configuration where we're going to take a laser. It's maybe not that simple, but if you come from an electronics background, it's maybe not too complex. So the concept there is we're going to basically remodulate laser so we're going to shoot a laser beam from the outside of your house at your Amazon Alexa or your whatever series and whatnot are using this voice activated AI, right? So there's obviously a lot of security weaknesses that comes along with all of this technology. So obviously artificial intelligence can be good and bad. I'm not yet to tell you if it's good or bad. I'm yet to tell you we need to know about the uses and start building systems. So here we can see a simple configuration, deep learning and artificial intelligence. That's showing you the uh, Intel Mavidius, that neural compute stick. So this is going to allow us to build neural networks. Neural networks, if you want to think of it as, as something as simple as a brain. A neural network is not just a human brain. We also have neural networks for reinforced learning, and we've got a lot of other types of forms of AI. So uh, the Intel subsidiary Movidius recently launched the neural compute stick. That was a couple of years ago. And uh, you can see the uh, Myriad 2 VPU housed inside the Movidius neural compute stick. It's a little bit bigger than a USB flash drive, probably about double the size, uh, with more than 100 gigaflops of performance within a one watt power envelope. That's pretty amazing. So that's where you can take a single Movidius neural compute stick, add that, let's say, to your Raspberry Pi. Uh, Raspberry Pi 4 is a lot better. You could still do it with Raspberry Pi 3s and so forth. But obviously, with a 8 gig of RAM, Raspberry Pi 4, that's going to be a lot more efficient. So uh, this is how we now start realizing most cell phones already have the uh, neural compute stick built in. So they have the neural networks for information. That was that uh, hive mind uh, that I showed you from Shield AI. We looked at that earlier on. So of course, this is where you start realizing that we're going to get a lot more of these robotic type devices that, uh, especially when we start looking at what's been going on lately, right? So, uh, you know, collecting uh, uh, medical swabs, as an example, could be, you know, done by a robot in the near future. And of course, that's going to save a lot more of the you know, frontline workers from getting themselves injured in their line of duty, so to say. All righty, folks. So uh, hopefully you're enjoying the session today. We are going to jump into some uh, hands-on right now. And uh, let's take a look at the base hardware for Raspberry Pi Zero. So these are very small, low-powered, single-board computer systems based on ARM architecture. So you've got a one gigahertz CPU, 512 meg RAM. You can see with the Raspberry Pi Zero comes in two specs, one without the wireless and one with wireless built in. They normally don't come with the GPIO soldered or soldered onto the board. So what that is, is you're literally like an extra USB bus that you can then wire all sorts of things straight to your actual computer system. So this is where we can actually tinker with all of your A, uh, your IoT devices. Like as an example, we're going to be showing you how BetterCap is running on Raspbian OS, which is based on Debian. And we're going to show you how you can, of course, add some of that BetterCap and then some of that Ponagotchi, some of the AI. And then maybe you want to go and add some uh, mouse jacking because BetterCap is that Swiss Army knife tool network man in the middle. If you haven't been using BetterCap, this is going to be a great hardware device to help you learn. The core underlying root of this system will be BetterCap, uh, which will give you a little bit more detail shortly. And that really came from the folks that originally designed some of the attack vectors off of the Sammy Cam car. So uh, Sammy Kamkar, just shout out to that guy. He's amazing. He shares a lot of knowledge with the world. 
and um, he came out with Poison Tap. So if you go and Google Sammy Camcar and Poison Tap, you'll see that's where the initial you know uh, seeds were uh, uh, planted effectively for this next project, which is called Pone Pi. It's a German uh, open source developer that's put this project together. And uh, you can see the link there. That's going to be showing you how you can take the Raspberry Pi Zero and build all of your very, 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 very advanced hacker tools. So your software and your hardware combining those two capabilities to achieve a pretty advanced device. So that's kind of where a lot more of these attack vectors started coming out, where you're going to see if we have the Raspberry Pi Zero, we're going to be able to solder the mouse jack. We can use the IoT module, or you can actually buy one that's already in a USB format. So uh, it all depends on how much tinkering you want to be doing. But if you wanted to just to add it, you could add the actual IoT module, which is a specific IoT uh, radio frequency chipset that's going to support um, keystroke injection attacks against wireless keyboards and mouses. So the non-Bluetooth type devices. Now you're going to see you've obviously got your micro SD slot for your operating system. You've got Bluetooth. You've got 4.1 Bluetooth. And you've also got wireless built in where BetterCap will be able to use the built-in wireless, even though it's Broadcom, to do some of the packet capture. So uh, monitor mode. You don't have to plug in an external device. And you'll see if we go along and add an e-ink screen to this, this is going to make it a much more efficient device as well. So you can see the basic hardware spec there. And uh, speaking on some of the features that the PonePi project brought. So you're going to see learning Ponagotchi and ensuring you can set up something like this project PonePi. I would recommend setting this up manually. So not just flashing the image of everything set up for you. We know that's easy, right? That's just restoring all of your partitions and everything will work out the box. Well, you're not going to learn if you don't build it. So uh, you've got to remember to read a book and not to do what you read in the book is not completing the learning cycle. You need both the academic input first and then you need the practical applying that. So that's when we speak about all these educational facilities. They want to get your KSAs, your knowledge, skills, and abilities. So a lot more of the examinations that people have been taking are changing because there's a lot more hands-on practical exams. And that makes it a lot easier. So you had all these HID covert channels. HID is what I was speaking about now, the keyboard, mouses. Your HID attack is basically your human interface device where we can actually load an array of pre-programmed commands that you would just simply plug in, let's say, your Raspberry Pi Zero, and it's going to be turned into a keyboard that's going to run a huge array of complicated key, key, keyboard key injection attacks. I'm sorry, folks, there, there's a huge uh, uh, truck collecting garbage outside my office. That'll be another 30 seconds. So at least you've got time to read the slide there. And uh, the HID is your human interface device. So we'll be able to use that to set up front door, back door uh, tunnel sessions where we can get remote shell access uh, to all different types of targets, not just Windows. Uh, we've also got a Windows 10 lock picker. We'll be able to steal your browser credentials. So dump stored browser credentials and copies them to the built-in flash drive. It's got a built-in Wi-Fi hotspot, so you can SSH back to it. It also allows you to use Bluetooth to connect to the device. And um, as you can see, there's client mode, so relays USB net attacks over Wi-Fi, all with it being man in the middle, so a lot of network wired and wireless man in the middle attack vectors. And then you've got all of these USB devices, which basically emulates your head. So it emulates a keyboard, uh, it emulates a mouse. It can also emulate, oh, actually there is USB storage, but you had to go and do some customizations there. And then as you're gonna see when I go into some of the demos shortly, 
we'll see the RNDIS. This is your Windows networking where I'm going to plug in my Ponagotchi to my laptop and you're going to see how it's going to be setting up an RNDIS adapter where I'm then going to be able to SSH into Ponagotchi where I can then show you some of the architecture and we'll cover more of the capabilities. So again, this is showing you how we can launch a lot of the attacks that I'm sure you're pretty familiar with when it comes to your bash-based payload scripts. So there's a, a subfolder for a lot of uh, bash scripts. Responder, you've probably used that before. It's a fake responder to your Windows uh, LLMNR um, and NetBIOS attack vectors. So that's all built in. You've got to be in the active local network. John the Ripper for doing brute, brute forcing uh, password cracking. And uh, then obviously some more of those advanced features that you can look more into. And when you compare it with some of the commercial products that are being sold, uh, you're going to see that the open source tools, when you as a pen tester learn how to build or customize or modify your tools, like the project that somebody else has created as an example, for us to be able to obviously really understand penetration testing, uh, it's not always feasible, but we want to try our best, obviously, to try and use and customize a lot of the tools that we want to utilize. So we've got a much closer in-depth understanding of all the good and bad points of sometimes using a hacker tool. So remember, if we're doing professional pen testing, our objective is to try and assess the target computer environment as closely as possible map, map into what a criminal would do. But what we have to do is try and do that in a manner that is least severe to your organization. So when we're trying to do penetration testing, you're not going to be you know, a very popular company if you're going to crash some of those target systems. So you want to always make sure we have to do things like the criminal malicious hackers do, but we have to do it in a business model. So it means we've got to have it managed. It's got to be specifications. We've got to have service level agreements. We follow a strict regime. I'm not saying the criminals don't. I'm just saying that the reality is we've got to understand the business elements play a very important role just as much as the technical elements do in penetration testing. So those were just some of the feature comparisons with some of the um, commercial products made available. And now we can get into a little bit of Ponagotchi. And this is where you know Ponagotchi comes from the good old days of uh, you know um, uh, Tomagotchi. So it was that little digital pet that we had to keep giving it food, you know, throughout the day. And of course, um, Ponagotchi is not going to be you know, requiring you to give it food. It basically gets its food based upon cracking uh, WPA passwords. Now it does that when I say it's it's not it's both in multiple modes. So it can be doing that passively, where it's just going to be in and around a network where it's going to be able to passively sniff and capture handshakes, your WPA, one of your WPA, E-A-P-O-L. That's your authentication, uh, your extensible authentication protocol over LAN. So uh, you normally need at least one, and in some cases one of those E-A-P-O-L hashes are not enough, but most of the times one is sufficient for you to go along and brute force crack that key or other methods we're going to be looking at. Uh, obviously, um, with Ponagotchi, it's able to do that in complete passive mode, or when it's in active mode, it's going to then use AI. So it's going to get better at performing based upon its local environment. If you add more Ponagotchis to the network, you can start creating more intelligence. So initially, it's doing very little, though, as you'll see. So without further ado, let's uh, jump to uh, Ponagotchi and go through some of the uh, core elements from the material. All right, so we're looking at ponagotchi.ai, and uh, you can see the latest version is 153. And if you love this project, I always recommend uh, uh, supporting the developer. It is uh, Simone, he's a great Italian guy, and um, he's been building so many cool cybersecurity devices that the whole industry have been using, maybe without a whole lot of knowledge. So before we just jump into the Ponagotchi, 
Many of you will have heard of BetterCap. So if you just go to bettercap.org, and I'm just being lazy today. There you can see BetterCap is a network man in the middle attack tool. Uh, it's actually a lot more than that. It's a Swiss Army knife tool for both uh, multiple different technologies, wireless, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, low energy, wireless head hijacking. You do need to have that specific chipset though. So either use a Logitech or a Hack RF, um, uh, not Hack RF, uh, Crazy Radio dongle or um, the actual NRF specific IoT chipset. So uh, you, you need to use one of those devices that actually give you the head hijacking. Of course, if you want more information about it, just open up a new tab and you can go and read more about the human interface device hijacking where you're going to be injecting keystroke logs. So that is based upon the original work from uh, Bastille Networks. And if you go and check out mousejack.com, that's where a lot of this mouse injection stuff started to become a lot popular. It was obviously already being done way before then in the good old uh, uh, backtrack days where some of those uh, same guys were doing a lot of uh, research and development doing the same things. So that's a lot of where this initial research came from. Mousejack obviously is a company that put all the research together. So you can go and see more details um, at their website or just simply go to the Mousejack GitHub. Because that's where we should be spending a lot of our time taking the code and reverse engineering it and building our own stuff. So one of the greatest tools that you're going to see nowadays with a lot more of the EC Council advanced certifications coming out I'm very good friends with a lot of the uh, developers who happen to come from a military background. So I can tell you right now, they're gonna be very, very challenging. So if you wanna get better at reverse engineering, I suggest you go and look at using some of these open source tools, such as Ghidra from uh, the US NSA uh, research lab. So a uh, lot of capabilities with Ghidra for reverse engineering. It's almost becoming like a de facto for uh, a lot of, yes, we've got commercial products that are great, but uh, we've got to actually look at also very fine and validating our results. So remember with pen testing, we don't just trust one tool, we're going to make sure we verify and validate the results of at least three different tools. All right, so we're looking at bettercap.org, and uh, as you can see, you can read all about the project introduction, which uh, will help you get an insight into um, Simone's mind of why he built a whole lot of these things. But um, I would suggest you go and read the actual legacy documentation first. And if you go down to their website on the bottom left there, you'll see there's a legacy doc. So to bring you up to speed with where BetterCap came from, it will, allow you to obviously get a quick refresher on good old man in the middle attack vectors. This is not just doing standard man in the middle attacks. This is doing a lot more advanced such as um, uh, you can see this video demo they had there, SSL stripping with partial HSTS bypass. All right, so you're able to launch a lot of the latest and greatest attack vectors and that's because it's based upon open sourceness meaning it's running an open source Linux operating system. And of course, you can go and read a lot more about the basics of a man in the middle attack. Remember, the attack in itself starts off with an ARP spoof or ARP poisoning where we simply using a gratuitous ARP reply. It's not sophisticated. We learned networking in like a network plus course. The first day we're learning some of the basics of ARP address resolution protocol. So of course, we start going, well, hang on a second, what about IPv6? Well, remember we've got IPv6 with a lot more security features, but IPv6 has to be backward compatible. So a lot of times the problem is it's not backward compatible, right? So that's why IPv6 means you've normally got a lot more vulnerabilities because you've got the IPv6 vulnerabilities. And you've also got the IPv4 
potential backward compatibility vulnerabilities. So take a look at the documentation and that will sufficiently prepare you to where we're at now with our Ponagachi. So that was all based upon the better cap. And um, you'll see, I'll be demonstrating to you the actual web interface that you have as well. And going back to that uh, Ponagachi, we can see it's running basically better cap as the heart of the system. And this is a Raspberry Pi Zero with a e-ink screen. And I think they could have made it a little bit nicer 3D printed uh, there, but hey, he zoomed up pretty much there. I'm not gonna complain there because you know, um, I have some British blood in me and sometimes British people are known as whinging pommies. I, I'm, I'm just saying they used to call me that when I went to school in London. All right, so um, yeah, I, I'm a half breed at least. So I got to experience all sides of different cultures which is why some of you might not have heard of Tomagotchi days. So uh, when you go along and look at where this comes from, obviously you can see that is the reference to the toy from the 1990s called the Tamagotchi. And uh, we don't have to get into some of the deeper details there, but we want to look at how it works. And it does like, and it eats like um, WPA handshakes. So what we want to start off with is a little bit of what type of AI does this use? Well, real simple, it uses reinforced learning. So we want to speak a little bit about an intro to advanced actor critic, your A2C, which is basically what uh, Ponogotchi is running. A lot of reinforced learning practitioners, they've produced a number of excellent tutorials. A lot of those from this person's point of view, describe your reinforced learning in terms of mathematical equations and abstract diagrams and uh, we like to think of them uh, of the field from a different perspective so reinforced learning itself is inspired by how animals learn so why not translate the underlying reinforced learning machinery back into the natural phenomena they're designed to mimic and that's the part where you start realizing now you might have remembered back in the good old days learning programming. Remember when I was learning the same thing, it was boring as heck. You know, uh, the reason why I didn't probably go into a programming career very much was because I was it was boring. You know, some of you love it uh, with all due respect. I'm not, you know, I'm just letting you all know that that was because of the way we were learning back then. Now, if you go and look at Nicholas Negroponte, he was one of the four founders of MIT. A couple of years ago, they did a uh, um, a study. They delivered 10 tablets to rural kids in Ethiopia. Those kids basically lived in mud huts and didn't obviously even have electricity. They had to have a generator to charge those tablets. Now, without a single you know, uh, 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 lesson from a teacher, uh, they were given these devices and they figured these devices out themselves. So this is, how did they do that? They did it because they kind of had a picture, they had an image that was given to them and they, had, they kept trying to extract the information from that image. And so this really is a story about the actor advantage critic, critic model. Um, they're a popular form of policy graded model, which in itself is a vanilla reinforced learning algorithm. Everything within AI is based upon using algorithms, which is basically like how you do things. And there's a lot of resources you can go and work through yourself. Some of the simple code implementations there and uh, giving you an awesome way to learn this through pictures. And so there you can see, there is the Mr. Agent Cranberry Fox. He's uh, in reinforcement, he's re in reinforcement learning. An agent moves through the states in an environment by taking action, trying to maximize rewards along the way. And they got a whole lot of other cool ones there you want to go and check out because uh, they got really good tutorials there. So there you can see it's going to take in a state, your sensory inputs in Cranberry's case, and generate two outputs. One, 
an estimate of how many rewards they expect to get from that point onwards, the state value, and two, a recommendation of what action to take, the policy. So you can go and read a lot more about that. You've got to actually go through it and process it yourself. And that still might still be, I don't know what the heck Wayne's been speaking about. So when you do that, that's when you go along and say, okay, I suppose the only way to really understand this is go and do it. Let's build it. Aha. So we now back at Ponagotchi. And when you look at a quick introduction, we're going to be looking at how it works, basically. Some of the personality and moods. Wow. We've got AI and this has got different types of moods. Good moods, bad moods. And, well, okay. And, uh, oh, bonding with other units. Awesome. So there's a huge array of different faces that obviously you can bring in your kids to this project as well. Your children are already starting to learn a lot more about AI because they're already learning to use basic computer systems when they start their first year of kindergarten, basically, in a lot of countries. So there's a lot of cool faces there. And then finally, we'll be diving deeper into the Wi-Fi Handshakes 101, which is what we're looking to capture here. And the idea about Ponagotchi folks today's session is not just to teach you about Ponagotchi, it's to teach you about the importance of being able to build and customize. So let's say you go along and you're gonna take some of the cybersecurity scripts that you're already using in Kali Linux or Parrot or any other cybersecurity script or tool that's been developed. And we wanna be able to take that and build that into a device that's using AI to obviously do more of our work more effectively by adding more intelligence to our attack vectors. So this is not just about Ponagotchi, this is about how you can take a project and start learning about AI. Uh, you folks will be able to you know, feed up with the FAQs in about 15 minutes where uh, we'll do a quick poll and see how many of you, and this is where we wanna get your honest truth, right? How many of you have already started looking at building anything that has to do with artificial intelligence? I know that for a very long time, I didn't. I was like, you know what? That stuff, I, I just seen too many weird movies that I was freaked out by and going like, I don't know, this is just not gonna be good, right? And then we start realizing, well, that's because of fear. So when people have a fear, it's because they're not certain of the outcome. And if we wanna have more certainty of the outcome, well, then we wanna go and address that topic we call fear. We're going to learn about it. So as you can see, this is Ponagotchi. It's powered by BetaCap that learns from its surrounding Wi-Fi environment in order to maximize the crackable WPA key material it captures. So either through passive sniffing or by performing deauthentication and association attacks. So basically using some of its AI. And this material is collected on disk as your network PCAP files containing any form of crackable handshakes that are supported by Hashcat. So another crucial tool that you need to know inside out. Hashcat is the de facto tool for cryptography, cracking passwords, encryption, you name it, whether it be GSM or whether it be, you know, uh, Linux hashes. We use a lot of Hashcat because open source and allows us to add our GPU and other graphics card hardware processing support. So we spoke about a little Ponagotchi, and uh, for those of you that want more details, you can go and check out their usage doc there, which is going to give you more details on how to train your Ponagotchi. Because here's one of the problems you're going to find. Whilst Ponagotchi is awesome, it's really been built and trained on a Raspberry Pi Zero, which only has 2.4 gigahertz wireless. So it's only got 2.4 gigahertz. If you wanted it to be used on a Raspberry Pi 4, maybe that could be your new project. If you want to teach it, oh, you've got to go ahead and retrain your Ponagotchi to be operating in the 5 gigahertz spectrum as well. So currently there's only the built-in engine and algorithm for 2.4 gigahertz. But of course, you can go and read a lot more about their documentation there, about training the AI. And that's exactly as I was uh, mentioning to you folks about the 2.4 slash 5 gigahertz. All right, so multiple units within close physical proximity can talk to each other 
And this is where you can go along and modify all of these procedures. So you don't just have to use Pona Gotcha to do the wireless. You can go along and actually set up your custom network IP tables and set up your custom attack vectors and start looking at the underlying system of Ponagotchi so that you can then look at building it into a different project, maybe for your defense, maybe using uh, uh, cybersecurity decoys in your network as an example. So uh, depending on the status of the unit, you're going to be able to go along and set up some of the features in a configuration file and uh, there's more details on that. So there's a lot of different personality modes, not too important. And then starting from version 1.1.0, you're able to bond with other units. So you can go and set up some of those. Um, two or three Raspberry Pi zeros, as an example, is awesome. And uh, <clears throat> what we're gonna do in a few moments is I'm gonna take you through, once you've downloaded Ponagotchi, you flashed it to your SD card, that's going to be your operating system effectively. We won't be going through that. I'm sure you can Google that. What Ponagotchi is going to be doing is capturing Wi-Fi handshakes. And obviously, it's seen as that similar to Tamagotchi because instead of you feeding your digital pet, it's going to be getting its food by sniffing and saving all of your Wi-Fi handshakes. So you can go and configure to do more malicious, but by default, um, depending on how you power it on, it's going to be able to be running one of a couple of different modes. Manual mode will be needed when we go along and use better cap first, and then uh, automatic mode, which is where the AI engine will kick in after about 10 or 15 minutes. So mm -hmm. your fundamentals of your Wi-Fi handshakes, you can read more about. Uh, all of these website links are in the PowerPoint presentations, which uh, I'm sure EC Council will be sharing as well. So uh, you will have access to the video to watch and uh, you'll have access to the PowerPoints. So that's the basics there. And there's a tip there about the above modes where uh, you've got to be very careful. If you just flash it and you leave it, it's going to be in... AI mode, if you plug it into your specific, uh, I'll be showing that in a minute. So be aware of that. If you're going to basically power this device up in a location where you're not allowed to be doing things like a de-authentication attack on the network is going to force people to disconnect and reconnect. So always make sure you are aware of your local laws. You don't want to go to jail for, you know, accidentally playing with your Ponagotchi. Uh, just because you were near a military base, as an example. So that obviously wouldn't be a good idea if you're close to military base, right? And that was just, you know, some of my bad humor for today. All right, so of course, that's then going to be doing some of the, you know, sending association frames directly to the access points themselves. So you're going to be able to continuously manipulate additional Wi-Fi management frames as well. And so the installation is literally download the backup of the hard drive, get the image, which is already set up with everything you need. It's based on Raspbian OS, and they're going to take you through how you can add your real-time clock, how you can add the hardware e-ink screen. So today's demo, you do not have to have any of these things at all. So the minimum you need is a Raspberry Pi Zero, and at that point, that's where we're going to go from at first boot. So uh, we're not going to go and add any exclusions to that. Uh, this would have got you to go along and just set up like your initial configuration file. So I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to go straight from the point when you've done the flashing of your image and the head instructions there on the installation. So we've already flashed the image and we've letting us boot. So as you're going to see, I'm now going to be connecting my cable to the data port. So that's the inner port over there. The outer port is power only. So I'm going to be plugging this into my data port so that my Windows machine will detect that gadget. So if I go to my network connections, I'm going to power it on so long. And as I'm powering it on, it is plugged into that inner port. 
and in a few moments we should see a new RNDIS gadget appear. There it is. So it's detected a new Ethernet 2 adapter and you can see it's come up as an RNDIS gadget. So we then go along and look at the properties of that adapter. And in order to set up the Ponogotchi, you need to go and give it a static IP address of something in the range of 10, 0, 0, whatever you want the last octet to be. So the default there is that Ponogotchi is configured with 10, 0, 0 0.2. And of course, when I powered on Ponogotchi, <clears throat> it's uh, emulating an Ethernet, a USB Ethernet adapter, as you've just seen in the form of an RNDIS gadget. So that's been set. And I can now simply go to my, I can SSH into the device. And it's just pi and the password is raspberry. It's just the default. So that's a default Raspbian login. So as you can see, even if you don't have an Ethernet port on your laptop, so you may be using a cheap netbook, let's say, as an example, or something like that, you realize you're going to be able to plug in your Ponogotchi, which is emulating an adapter. And then we'll just go ahead and get sudo, get root access. And then if you look at the main directories there, You will have a folder called Handshakes, another folder called Peers, and then you're going to have your Brain JSON and then your Brain NN. So that's all of your AI that you can then go along and train and modify and so forth. But of course, in your Handshakes folder will be where all the Handshakes are then stored. If you do something like if config, you will see that it's got that it's got multiple adapters there. Uh, the one that is obviously emulating there, there's the USB zero dot, uh, uh, adapter that it's emulating, so that it is configured as a 10002 client. So now what that means is I can now go along to using the better cap. Okay, better cap, it's only supported. So when you run your device into, sorry, when you run your device and you want to use better cap, the AI cannot be running. So it's basically going to be running in manual mode. And if we go along, we'll show you in a second, uh, there's details on the usage and showing you how you can use the BetterCap web UI. So I'm just going to go ahead and access the UI from uh, my 10 000, And then I'm going to log in straight to BetterCap. And this is now logged into the BetterCap UI. This is the web interface. And uh, as I was mentioning there, with the Ponogotchi there, the BetterCap web UI, your Ponogotchi has to be running in manual mode. So in order to use the WebCap, uh, BetterCap's web UI, you need to boot your Ponogotchi into manual mode. So that will give you all the details about manual mode as i've just shown you i booted up on my laptop with the usb cable plugged into the inner data and power port and then you can see the default authentication credentials to log into better cap will be ponogotchi ponogotchi and so we could go ahead and do the lan attacks so there you can see that is my own raspberry pi zero that has monitor mode enabled. So there's the Mono Zero adapter. So we've got Wi-Fi attacks. I'm not going to be going through all of the attacks, but if you go along to BetterCap, you'll see that BetterCap uses specific modules or caplets. So you can go ahead and build very advanced attack vectors by looking at the current caplets that is built into BetterCap. So as an example, if you go in like, um, 
you know what i got a facebook phishing attack that we want to look at uh, launching here's an example of a, a facebook phishing caplet which is as i've mentioned a caplet is literally like a scripted network attack with all the components so the capture file and any other code you're going to need probably setting up some fake portal there you've got some other caplets there's a crypto miner so uh you can see this lets you inject a JavaScript crypto miner. So making sure that uh, advanced pen testing that requires us to do things like reverse engineering the code. Then if you're on the same network, there's a auto pwn downloader component. There's a lot of awesome tools. Now, some of you would have heard of the MANA toolkit. MANA toolkit from Sensei Post guys that uh, built some amazing post APD stuff. So great shout out to uh, all those guys from uh, Sensei Post. Uh, many of them are also South African British. Uh, they've got an office in London and are also still based in South Africa. Now, you would have known them before. They've given a lot of presentations at Black Hat, DEF CON on Wi-Fi security. So this is showing how you can launch. This is why BetterCap has kind of become the world's de facto uh, man in the middle attack framework. So uh, you can pull all of the things that we were able to do with individual scripts in the past, where we can now go along and build a caplet. So uh, think about a decoy, right? Your decoy could be set up with Ponagotchi's idea of using AI. So when somebody's on your real hardware decoy, you're not going to just let them drop the database. You're going to use AI to give them bit by bit. So you're going to keep them on your device for a lot longer time. But uh, there you can see the different Ponagotchi auto manual modes. So uh, you've got all the ingredients to go out and combine all sorts of advanced attack vectors. Then there's the Bluetooth low energy scanning. You've got the built in Bluetooth on um, your Raspberry Pi Zero. There's the HID. But for the HID attack to work, you're going to need to get something from like um, Hacker Warehouse such as um, crazy radio so if you just go to hackerwarehouse.com or other sites that sell a crazy radio which was really designed to uh, control uh, uh, open source drone it was a tiny small little very capable drone and so you're going to need to have that hardware device for the uh, injection the head attack vectors as you can see it's all there but uh, you need to actually have that hardware device as i've just shown you folks so uh, ponagotchi is amazing now let's show you the better cap ui so remember if you don't have the e-ink screen not to worry you can see how you can run all of the better cap attack vectors which are very very advanced and now we're going to look at the ponagotchi e-ink face so the actual if you don't have an e-ink screen you can simply run the uh web version of this and uh, you just basically run it on the 10.0.0.2 on port 8080 and the default password to get you in here i think is uh change me And there you're going to see basically you've got a lot more of your controller objects there, home, inbox. So you can even do messaging like mesh network messaging off the grid, profile peers and other plugins that you obviously want to add to that. And then there was just showing the details of the last session. So it got six handshakes, made three new friends and kicked five stations. There was all in my own controlled network. And you can see at the bottom right, Ponagotchi is running in manual mode. You can change the name of it to whatever you want. But uh, of course, if you wanted to then reboot the device, you've got a, a restart in auto mode, which will then kick in the AI. And of course, when you finish doing whatever you wanted to be doing with Ponagotchi, you can go ahead and shut him down or her down. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That was all we have time for today. 
Uh, hopefully you found today's session very uh, informative. And uh, as I mentioned, those are some of the things that I already showed you folks. And um, you can read more from the ponagotchi.ai website. Last little bit of uh, input, I suggest, make sure you are following on the network. So for advanced cybersecurity tools, specifically some of the networking stuff we're looking at today, we need to know the network inside out. So you need to be a seasoned packet crafting analysis expert. So you can go along and create it basically analyze all the packet capture files and figure out what took place. Using an open source system such as ROC NSM, it's your network response operation collection kit, uh, open source network monitoring security monitoring platform. Based, basically, this is a bit as it's meant to be a better designed version than the Security Onion. I'm not saying it's better, I'm just saying that it was designed to be more multi threaded. So, a lot more work, recent work went into uh, the building of ROC NSM and it's been made into a not for profit project. So, a lot more. Uh, Open source network security monitoring can be used with using this design infrastructure. And there you folks have my uh, details. Uh, so uh, let me know if any of you folks need some any uh, uh, other more uh, in-depth knowledge in some of these topics. Today's session was not to try and solicit any business. So uh, please see it as just giving you some of those links, giving you that information that can help you in your career. And I'm going to hand it back to hopefully the folks at EC Council. I don't know if they're going to go and select uh, questions that I will answer or if I'm going to go and read them. I'm not sure. But uh, if you folks want to start typing your questions, welcome to go, go ahead and type the questions into the box. And uh, we're going to then go ahead and answer them either myself or EC Council read the question and I'll then answer it. All right, Wayne, uh, thanks a lot for today's session. Yeah, everyone, just before we head into the Q&A session, I'm gonna run a small poll. Basically, just do participate in it and yeah, feel free to add in your questions in the questions tab and Wayne, you can go ahead and answer them. Great, okay. Everyone, we just have about five minutes to do question and answers as we have run out of time. So if you do have questions, do put them into the questions tab. So I'll give another two minutes and if we don't have any questions coming in, then I shall wind up the session. So we do have one question in win. It's on a tool that to run a pen test for a large organization. Okay, I'm just trying to see where that message is. Oh, hang on, there's the chat there. I didn't see the message. So you're gonna have to read it, please. Yeah, so the question is any tool to run a pen test for a large organization? Um, so when it comes to a large organization, you're going to obviously be looking at commercial tools. Uh, Metasploit, of course, in its uh, open source version is amazing. You can do 95% of your pen tests with Metasploit. Of course, in big enterprise companies, they might want you to be using the commercial version of Metasploit because it gives you a whole lot more of the 
risk elements that you can add in. So uh, again, I'm not a associated with Metasploit, but uh, when it comes to your advanced tools, it's been able to use open source tools like Metasploit framework. BetterCap is another framework. So it's a lot of these tools that are using framework-like interactiveness to basically communicate and collaborate with one another. So that's where you start looking at being able to take, let's say, Ponagotchi and actually build it in to your Metasploit, even the open source Metasploit framework for it to be used in commercial pen tests. So as an example, we'll go along and build a very secure Raspberry Pi system that we're going to ship to a client site that we can then have them plug in with all the security that we require and they require in accordance to the local laws. But we're going to be able to then remotely perform that penetration test as if we're in that local office building facility. So uh, this is where you've seen it's taking some of this knowledge that I've shown you today and realizing how you can now go along and build your cyber tool like a remote pen testing system that you can then install at different locations. Like you might have multiple customer sites locations where you might have to have six different uh, uh, sites, network sites tested. And of course, uh, with travel being very difficult lately with all the different restrictions, it's not always feasible or possible. So we're going to see a lot more demand of this. Being able to ship your you know, open source hardware device that you've set up with all of the software to enable you to do secure remote pen testing. Hopefully that answers the question there, folks. And like I said, the best thing to be doing, folks, is make sure you understand more about how the tools are actually built. So when you know how they're built, you can actually go along and modify all of these tools. That's the key point, is to take a tool that you know does something one way and then look to modify it to do, obviously, more advanced attack vectors. Just want to thank you once again, folks, for joining our uh, short, uh, hopefully informative session today. And uh, do feel free to give some awesome feedback to uh, EC Council if you like these types of sessions with a lot more hands-on. Do give us some good feedback so we can keep these running repetitively and often for you folks. Thanks once again. Have a wonderful super day. Stay healthy and safe out there. Eat healthy food. Do exercise twice a day. Try and figure out some yoga because you'll then move all of your energy throughout your body, making your whole body a lot more healthier. So strengthening your immune system. Yeah, all right, Wayne. I think we've just run out of time. And I would like to thank you on behalf of EC Council for doing this amazing session with us today. I'm sure it was informative for everyone. And everyone, I've had been having a lot of questions regarding the presentation or a recording of this session. So just to let you all know, we will be uploading a recording of this to our YouTube channel so you can view it at the, from there at any time. And for those of you who had questions and we couldn't get to you, feel free to write into me at daniel.p at eccouncil.org and you know we'll get it uh, patched in through to the win and you know we'll get back to you with answers for the same. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for being here with us today. We hope to see you during our next session. Have a nice day.